Hello, and welcome to the Hemophilia Federation of America's Storytelling Webinar. My name is Sarah Schinkman. I am the Outreach and Advocacy Manager for HFA. As I mentioned, we'll be talking about storytelling because everyone has a story to tell. For some, knowing how to shape and craft your words can be intimidating, especially when you are using storytelling for advocacy. In today's webinar, you'll learn what makes a good story and tools and skills to effectively share your personal narrative on how a bleeding disorder impacts your life. We are thrilled to have Dana Norris as our presenter. Dana is the founder of Story Club, a national nonfiction storytelling show. Dana teaches storytelling classes and has been featured in McSweeney's, The Rumpus, Tamper Review, Chicago Public Radio, and Cleveland Public Radio, among others. She pens the Dear Dana advice column for Role Reboot. I'll turn it over to Dana now to begin the presentation. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome, everyone, to Storytelling for Advocacy. My name is Dana Norris, and um, I'm going to be explaining today, first off, what storytelling is, why it's incredibly helpful in advocacy work, and how you can do it yourself. By the end of the webinar, you're going to have the necessary tools for creating and relating your own personal story. Um, first off, a little bit about me and how I know so much about stories. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, I founded Story Club in Chicago. Um, it has since expanded into six different cities. Um, it is a nonfiction storytelling show for adults held in the evenings, usually at breweries or bars, so I have a lot of experience with getting a room full of strangers to stop talking to each other and listen to me tell a story. Um, and so there's some things that I've learned, some tips and tricks over the years of doing that that um, I can teach to you so you can get other people to listen to your story as well. Um, I have an MFA in Creative Nonfiction from Northwestern and an MA in Religious Studies from the University of Chicago where I focused on religion as literature and stories. Um, I'm an award-winning author and I've been performing for over a decade. So um, the storytelling, this work has changed my life. And I do it because I believe that sharing a personal story connects people together and it makes a better world. A story is a window into someone else's life and it allows the people that are listening to your story to actually see the world through your eyes. And that is incredibly helpful when you're doing advocacy work, when you're making an argument, when you're trying to persuade an audience to take some action. Um, so let's start with the basics. Um, on our next slide, uh, we're going to talk about what is a story. So I always start off by talking about the difference between what a story is not. Um, a story is not an anecdote. Now, anecdotes are typical, you know, they're little short tales that we tell each other. Usually, you know, in social events when you're meeting someone at a party, when you're on a first date, when you're on a job interview, you know, they give someone the, uh, they're supposed to be amusing, they're supposed to be light and funny and entertaining, um, but they're not a story. And I'll, I'll describe this as an example. So I have a four and a half year old. And I also have a newborn. And ever since I had my newborn, my four and a half year old has been acting up and he's been eating toothpaste all of a sudden. He's putting all of the toilet paper down the toilet um, like he did when we first started potty training him. But now he's four and a half, but he's regressed. We have these chewy um, children's vitamins we give him every day. He's supposed to take one at dinner and he's just stealing them and taking them by the handful. Um, and so it's just like, what is happening? Um, so that's an anecdote. It's, you know, it's light, it's relatable, um, it's, there's, it's sort of ephemeral, right? And now let me tell you a story version of the same thing, which is, so I just had a newborn, and I have a four and a half year old. And it used to be that every morning I would wake up with my, with my four and a half year old and we would go downstairs and we would eat breakfast together. And then I'd go to work and I'd come home and every night I would read him a book um, and put him to bed. And now I don't do those things anymore because in the morning I'm so tired from being up all night with my newborn that I'm sleeping um, when he wakes up. 
and at night, that's usually when she needs to eat, so I'm feeding her. So my husband reads him a book, so I don't really get to see him much anymore. And he is eating toothpaste now, and he is putting toilet paper down the toilet, and he is, you know, the gummy vitamins that I usually give him after dinner, he's stealing them and taking them by the handful. And he loves his little sister. He loves her, and I think he's taking out his aggression appropriately on um his father and I, because we've just really changed his life. And I know it's fine. And, you know, he's going to have a sibling and he'll grow up and forget about this. But right now I just feel incredibly guilty because I have really upended his life and I miss him. And I know we'll get back, but for right now it's kind of hard. That was a story version of the same thing. The difference being that the story has a beginning, middle, and an end. It has something changing, it reveals a truth, and it has vulnerability to it. So in an anecdote, you tell a stranger and you come off looking pretty good. In a story, it's what you tell your best friend. And it is a little vulnerable, and it's a little revealing, and it's risky. Um, It has more emotional heft to it, and that is what makes it more relatable. Um, And we'll get into the science of how that works um, in a little bit. But so right now on the next slide, we're going to talk about why is, oh, sorry, (laughs) this slide, I love this piece of art. It says, the true artist helps the world by revealing mystic truths. And I put this here because it's something that I always work with with my students. They, you know, a lot of times when people take my storytelling classes, they start off by going, oh, I don't really know if anyone cares what I have to say like I don't really know if I like have like what do I know what truths do I know that need to be revealed you know and that story I just told you know a lot of people have more than one kid and a lot of people have their oldest kid have to sort of struggle with and get used to having a sibling Um, it's very universal so there's nothing new about it but what's new is your experience of it and the way you relate it and it is artistry to tell a story and it is something that when you do it well it is revealing a truth even if it's something that you think people know already um, it's just you're revealing it you're showing it to them again you're putting it in their face and letting them really feel it and understand it Um, so now why is storytelling a buzzword on the next slide um, we talk about so stories Storytelling is going around. There's a lot of corporate training that's looking for storytelling. There's all these seminars you can take about how to tell a story in an email. Um, The reason why storytelling is so hot right now is that it's like rediscovering an old truth, which is it's an ideal method of communication. Our brains are wired for narrative. We love stories. I mean, in many ways, Stories are the, the, your life is the story that you tell yourself. And so when you tell a story effectively, what you're doing is basically piggybacking your argument directly into your listeners' brains. And so when you say, want to tell a story to lobby a legislator to try to convince them to vote a certain way, um, the story will get them to pay attention to your idea much more effectively than a string of facts would. So stories, they work. This is why it's such a buzzword is because it really, really works. All right, so on the next slide, we're going to talk about why do stories work? What about them makes them work? Um, They're basically a magic trick. It's basically a little bit of sleight of hand that we're doing. We're using narrative to get an idea into someone's brain. It's a little bit like Inception. So stories are able to place ideas in your audience's minds. Um, Here we have a picture of the triune brain. So these are three different aspects of your brain. And they're evolutionarily speaking, it starts with the reptilian brain, which is the one that you don't even consciously think of. You know, it keeps you breathing, it keeps your heart going, and it also is Um, the survival instinct, fight or flight, when you get that jolt of adrenaline when someone scares you. It's the reptilian brain. After that is the limbic system. 
this controls emotions, your emotional response. Um, you know, fear, anger, love, sadness, all of that. And then higher than that is the neocortex. That's where we have speech and logic and these higher thinking skills. So when you tell someone a string of facts, when you say, um, this is why you should vote for this bill that will help to subsidize um, drug prices because drugs are so expensive and, you know, most people can't afford them and X number of individuals struggle to, you know, make their co-pays and X number of individuals struggle to afford their necessary prescriptions. All of those are being evaluated in the neocortex, in the logic center. But if you tell someone a story and if you are able to bypass the neocortex and go right into the limbic system. If you tell them a story, you are able to activate the emotional regions of their brain. And in doing so, they feel your argument instead of think about your argument. It's a way to get them to experience your own emotion. Um, when you're telling a story in front of a group of people. Neuroscientists have discovered something called mirror neurons. And when you're doing it well, the neurons of the people listening to you will mirror the neuron firing pattern of the teller. Um, it's also that they've done research that when in effective presentations, um, everyone in the audience's heart rates sync up. So their hearts are all beating at the same rate. They are basically enthralled. Um, in the magic of the story. And because of that, they are then, a, they then feel closer to the teller and they want to help the teller to aid them and they want to, um, they believe the argument that you're making. They're more likely to be convinced by it. So let's go to the next slide. And we're going to talk about, we're going to dive a little bit into neuroscience. So this picture, I love this because it's, you know, it's supposed to show, you know, neurons in the brain and all these um, emotions that you have surrounding, um, just swirling around in your head. Now, there is a neuroscientist named Dr. Paul Zak. And he set out to prove the connection between storytelling and a feeling of connection and closeness and bonding. Um, so he did that using um, an experiment that showed individuals two different presentations, two different films. Um, and he then, each film asked them to give money. So he measured how much money they gave at the end of each film. And then he went one step further and measured the level of oxytocin in their blood at the end of each film. So oxytocin is a chemical that your body releases. Um, it's, you know, it's the bonding chemical. Um, it makes you trust people. It's sort of a social lubricant. It makes you want to help someone. If you have oxytocin in your blood, you're more likely to, you know, be charitable. You're more likely to trust the person that you're listening to. Um, it's a, it's what's released with when a mom nurses her baby. So it's a very potent chemical. So he showed his audience two different movies, and he partnered with the St. Larry's Children's Hospital for this. And the first story, um, excuse me, the first video showed a father and a son at the zoo. And the son um, was a sm small boy, about six years old, and he's bald in the video. So he appears to be, you know, he has some form of childhood cancer, but the video doesn't really go into it. Instead, the video just shows them at the zoo, having a nice day, talks about the good work that St. Larry's Children's Hospital does, and asks for the viewer to give a donation. And it's very simple, straightforward, fact-based, pleasant to watch. The second video is just that same father in a room. And it's just him talking to the camera about the struggle that he has with his son having a diagnosis that says that he probably won't make it through his childhood. And this father's personal struggle with the fact that 
he, on one hand, of course, wants to help his son and be close to his son and enjoy it all the time he can with his son. And on the other hand, he finds himself receding from his son because he knows his son isn't going to stay around and his son is going to pass eventually. And he almost wants to save himself from that pain by disengaging in the present. And so he talks about seeing his son go through an especially difficult treatment and during that treatment deciding that no, despite the fact that the agony that will come whenever my son does pass, I am going to stay present for him and I'm going to be connected to him and I'm going to be there for him in every single way so the time that I have with him can be as good as possible. And at the end of that, they said, you know, donate to Larry's Children's Hospital. And the people donated four times more money after the second video of the father just talking than the first video. And Dr. Zach, the oxytocin levels in the people that watched the first video of the father and son at the zoo um, were just normal. And the oxytocin levels after the second video were huge. So all of this goes to show goes to show that when you tell a story, you are basically releasing oxytocin in your listener's brain that causes them to like you, to trust you, to believe you, and to want to help you. So this is scientifically why stories work for ad advocacy, because they enable the person listening to you to actually feel what you're feeling and to see the world through your eyes and to trust you. And that's really, really beneficial when you're lobbying, um, when you're trying to get someone to vote for a bill that would benefit you, um, to get them to actually see your position. Storytelling is the best way to do it. So we've talked about what a story is. We've talked about why stories work. Now we're going to go into what, how you make a story. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to um, talk about some things that good stories have in common. Um, so let's say you're going to sit down and you are going to create a story, but what things do you need to be inside that story? What does that story need to have in it to work? Um, it needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's important. The end is really important because anecdotes just have a beginning and a middle. You know, my son's acting crazy because I have a newborn. There's no end. My son's acting crazy because I have a newborn and I feel so guilty about it. And that's more of the beginning, middle, end. It needs to be a resolution. It needs to be a, and one day I know that he'll be fine, but for now I just need to find opportunities to show him he's still special and be with him. Good stories have to have conflict which means there needs to be some sort of tension, right? With the father and his son, I want to be there for him, but I also want to spare myself the pain of his eventual death. That is a conflict. That is, you want something that you can't really have. You can't have both of those. Um, there needs to be something at stake, which is to say, you need to relate to your listener why it's important to you. Um, emotional stakes are huge and it doesn't have to be a life or death scenario for it to have an emotional stake. Um, I have worked as a managing editor for a literary magazine called Triquarterly and I would always review um, nonfiction essays that came in and it was remarkable that the content, the actual events, didn't create the drama or the stakes. It was the emotional weight. So literally there was a story that I got um, of a woman that was born without legs and she was describing her life, but she was, she just kept saying over and over again how she was fine. And there wasn't any conflict. There wasn't anything at stake. She just, you know, I don't have legs, but I'm good. I have a very fulfilling life, which is great, but that's not a very compelling story. Um, and then I received another one that was literally about spilled milk, about, uh, it was a story where a woman talked about her son spilling some milk and her mom's reaction to that spilled milk and how she soaked it then up with a washcloth and wrung it out into a cup and made him drink it. And that is 
incredibly compelling because there's conflict, there's something at stake, like what's going on? Um, there's this emotional weight to it. So as long as you can convey why you care, then that's going to be a good story. Also, we need details. We need to be specifics. Um, we need, I always talk about concrete details, which is to say, what did it smell like? What did it taste like? What does it look like? You don't have to describe the entire room, but if you can really describe the couch in your grandma's house, I pretty much know what your grandma's house looks like. You know, if you can describe the plates that you serve dinner on, I kind of have an idea of what your kitchen looks like. Really hone in on those details because those help the listener to have the images in their mind and also to go into that limbic system and start to access their emotions. Also, something has to change in a good story. The beginning and the end should be different. Something should have resolved and there should be a new normal and that's a good way to think of it to say like do I actually have a plot going here which leads me to the fact that all of these aspects of a good story come from one thing which is plot um, now what what is plot we talk about that on the next slide which is a plot is this it's, it's in every book you've ever read. It's in every movie you've ever seen. Every TV show follows this plot arc. So we always start with an introduction, exposition. Who are the characters? Where are we? Um, I always use Star Wars as an example. You know, I'm just a moisture farmer sitting here wishing for adventure. So then we have rising action and complication, which is stormtroopers show up and they burn my house. They kill my family. Now I'm on the run. Um, and then throughout that complication, we have this rising action. So I'm running away from the Empire. The Empire is chasing me. They capture me. I escape. It's rising, rising, rising. The tension's going up, up, up. There's a Death Star. We have to get to it. How do we do that? Then there's the climax, which is I'm in the Death Star. I'm in my X-Wing. I'm going to fire the shot, and it has to go into the heart of the Death Star to, to explode it, and it does. The Death Star exploding is the climax, which is to say the peak of the action. After that, we have falling action slash consequence. And that's just, if he lands the X-Wing back and, you know, there's Han and they're all like, yay, cheer. And then the resolution, the denouement, we all get medals. It's great. And denouement is French for to unravel. So we unravel the knot and we now have a new normal. So we start with a form of normal, a form of stasis at the beginning of a story, and at the end of a story we have a new normal or a new stasis. Things have changed. Um, if you notice, the front half of the arc is much taller and sharper than the back half, and that's because after your climax, your story is essentially done. The tension, the things that keep us paying, att the, the, that keep us paying attention are gone. So once you have your climax, you need to wrap it up really quick. And the resolution section is a really good place to put your call to action in advocacy to say, now because of this, I need you to do this, to do your ask there at the end of the story. Um, on the next slide, there's another way of looking at this plot arc that is a little more uh, fun. Uh, sorry, one moment. There we go. So it's the same thing, but here we have it with these lovely cartoon characters. We have exposition. I want to be a king one day. Inciting incident. I hear there's a dragon. Rising action. I'm going to go fight the dragon. Crisis. This dragon's really hard to fight. Climax. I killed him. Denouement. I'm now the king. The end. New stasis. So this arc is a really good way to evaluate your story, to think of, okay, when I want to tell this tale, do I have um, a climax? Like, what's the rising action? And then what is the conclusion? Uh, so I think of um, a story that I heard of a person standing in line at CVS needing to get a prescription. And they're standing there going, I know I need to get this prescription. I know this prescription is very expensive. I know my credit card's maxed out. I know I have money in my checking, but I also know I still have to buy like gas for the rest of the week and I don't get paid for two weeks and this would clear out my checking and what do I do? And they're just standing in that line waiting. And then the, so that would be, the exposition would be standing in line at CVS. Inciting incident would be I need to get this prescription. 
the rising action is, I don't have the money necessarily to pay for it, the crisis. And then, you know, the embarrassment that would come from everyone behind in line knowing that you're struggling to pay for this. And then the climax is, how do you resolve it? And I'm just going to leave you hanging there because I'm sure you want to know, well, how is that resolved? So would your legislature. So think of scenarios you can create that you can explain that will show another person what it's like to have a bleeding disorder or what it's like to love someone with a bleeding disorder and to really put them in that moment. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about how you can create your own story, how you can find a story to tell. I believe strongly that every single person has thousands of stories within them. Um, I do this storytelling show every single month. I've been doing it for 10 years in multiple cities called Story Club. And we have featured performers and we have an open mic. And sometimes we don't have enough people sign up for the open mic. And that's okay. Because what always happens is the show starts, people start telling stories, and suddenly someone from the audience that did not plan on telling the story that night volunteers. Because they go, oh, I can do this. Like, I have something I want to say. I get it now. Um, so when you're thinking of what kind of story do I want to tell, how do I even pick what story to tell, pick a moment of strong emotion. Pick a moment when you felt something really intensely. It doesn't matter what it was about. If you, can, if you had that feeling, then that is a story worth telling. Because if you had that feeling, then there's something at stake immediately. There's a conflict. Um, a moment of transition is really good for a story. Sometimes when everything's changing, when you are first diagnosed or when um, you have to switch doctors or just some moment where everything is having to change because your, exp your personal experiences, when you put plot over the top of it, you have a story. That's what it is. So it's interesting. Um, we say... I said before, like, life is the story that you tell yourself. And I use the example of, say, you're going to work and you take a train to work and you go to the platform and you just miss the train. Now, what just happened? It depends on the plot that you apply. It depends on the narrative. Um, so either that was an example of how nothing ever goes your way and your life is awful and you're making terrible mistakes. It could be an example of how public transportation is nonsense and you need to get yourself a car. It could be uh, an example of how, you know what, maybe you need to quit that job. Maybe you don't need that job anyway. Maybe this is a gift that was given to you by the universe. I'm in this train, miss this train. You're like, you know what, I'll never go to that job again and I'm going to start off on a new adventure. It's what you choose to apply. So you have the experience but then the narrative that you apply to that experience is the story. So the events themselves are not a story. It's how you feel about the events that makes the story. So on our next slide, I'm going to talk about how you can actually start to physically write your story. Um, in my classes all the time, I have people come and they pay hundreds of dollars to come down and sit and basically what they're paying for is for me to look them in the eye and say, write something. Um, as, as a writer, I know that that is something you pay good money for because the first tip for writing for me is to sit down and write, which is something that most people don't do. <laughs> it's the first step that most of us never, never do it. So you need to clear out some time. You need to get yourself in a quiet space, um, and you need to sit down and write. And I always prefer to write pen to paper when I'm creating a new story, um, just because you don't have the squiggles underneath it that say, oh, you spelled this wrong, or this is grammatically incorrect, that you get when you're using a laptop or some sort of software. When you're writing by hand, it's a little bit cleaner that way. Um, so when you sit down to write, I always talk about... Uh, there's the idea of your brain is divided into different sections. There's left brain, there's right brain. Left brain is really good at making sure you pay your bills on time. It's great at noticing when something's wrong, needing to fix it. It's good at, you know, um, helping you, like, you know, look for an apartment. It's really good at fixing things. Your right brain is a, 
creative space where it's a little more random and a little more cluttered. And the left brain is great for editing, but the right brain is good for writing. And the problem with a lot of people have is they sit down to write and they start writing and their left brain starts editing as they're writing. Oh, you misspelled that. Like, oh, that's not a good idea. Like, oh, you can do better than that. Like, oh, this isn't going to work. And suddenly you, nothing's coming out because you're trying to fix it before it exists. You can't do that. You have to make it before you can fix it. So I'm going to tell you about a method of writing that I'd like you to try that will help you to get your story out so then we can fix it later. So I'm going to give you some prompts in a minute. And what I would like you to do is set aside 20 minutes. You can do it right now, pause this webinar, or you can set it aside later. But I want you to take 20 minutes of time, a pen and some paper, sit down in a room, set the timer, look at the prompts, pick one and then go with your first instinct. I don't want you to sit nitpick back and forth and say, oh, is it this or should I do that or is this more interesting than that? The story that you want to tell is going to come out of you. I feel really strongly about this um, that a lot of times I have students come to me and they start to write the story that they think they want to tell and then something else comes out. And I'm like, that's the story that you actually are supposed to tell right now is the story that appears. So you need to create space for that to happen. And there's a little bit of getting out of your own way for it. Because like your, your brain knows what it wants to get out. Um, we all have creativity inside of us. We just need to give it space and allow it to go. And so doing this exercise of sitting down and writing for 20 minutes, you're going to write straight through. You're going to start at the beginning of the story with the first idea you have. You're going to go through the middle and then to the end. You're not going to stop writing. And that's what's going to help you outrun your inner critic, your left brain. You're going to keep writing straight through. And sorry, a little bit of noise in the background. You're going to keep writing straight through. And I don't care if what you're writing is, I hate this. Why am I doing this? How much time is left? I don't think this is working. It doesn't matter because eventually you'll get bored of that and you'll get back to your story. And just tell what happened and let it come out in whatever tumble it comes out in. Because then after you have it, then you can fix it. You can't fix it before it exists. And so it's really important to create a space to allow yourself to make mistakes and to also to make revelations. Every time I have my students do this work, they discover something in the story that they hadn't planned on doing or even necessarily planned on talking about that's really interesting and really good and something they wouldn't have done had they sat down and plotted it out. So I encourage you when you sit down to develop your story, to give yourself that space and that permission to be messy and be creative and make mistakes and just write. And when you're done writing, read it and see what you had. And then you can fix it and shorten it up and make it, you know, just that see how it, you can make it conform to the plot arc and make it tighter so as you can present it to, say, your congressperson when you have a face-to-face -face with them and you only have, like, five minutes. Um, but in order to get there, first you have to make it. So I always encourage people to take the time to make the story and to actually create um, with that open space and to not be afraid of making mistakes because mistakes are really what you need in order to get a story out. Um, so on the next slide, I wrote down a few writing prompts that you can choose from. Um, the first one is write about a moment you didn't understand at the time. Write about a time you should have said something but didn't. Write about the last time you were really angry. Write about a time you were wrong. If you notice, all of these prompts are aimed at getting you to write about something that had a moment of emotion and conflict built into it. You know, stories about a time that you made a great decision and everything worked out fine aren't interesting because there isn't that conflict or no stakes. Stories about a time that you were unsure are very interesting and are likely to get the person listening to you to relate to you. It's that vulnerability, it's taking that risk in that story that helps to connect you with another person 
release that oxytocin in them and get them to really listen to you because they're going to want to know how did you pay for that prescription? What did you do when you got to the front of the line at the CVS? What did you do? What was the fallout? I want to know. I made up that story. I want to know. Um, so, yeah, write about, take one of these prompts, pick it, write for 20 minutes on it, and when the 20 minutes is up, you want to keep writing, keep writing. And if you don't, don't. And But I always encourage people to set aside this time to make the story happen. Um, and then you can do 20 minutes the next day and 30 minutes after that to just get into practice and the habit of doing it. And you'll find that you are creating pages and pages and pages of material. So um, on the next slide, um, I just want to say thank you guys so much for listening to this webinar. And I really encourage you to tell your story because every single person's story, it needs to be heard. Um, stories affect change and your story is important. It may not feel that way to you. We all tend to sort of diminish ourselves and think, oh, what does my tiny experience have to do with anything? But the universal is in the specific. And the more finely you can draw your story, the more you can help other people like you, and the more you can get other people to understand your position in the world and to relate to it and to take up your cause. Um, so I'm going to throw it back to Sarah now. Um, if you want to find me online, DanaNorris.net, StoryClubCleveland.com. You can email me, Dana at StoryClubCleveland.com if you're interested in information about upcoming classes or shows. Um, thank you very much, and I'll throw it back to Sarah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dana. That was fabulous. Um, I know I learned a lot just from sitting here and listening to the presentation, and I hope for all the folks who have been listening in um, that uh, this has also been beneficial for you as well. Um, I know Dana shared her contact information. If you'd like to reach out to HFA's team, you can contact us at advocacy at hemophiliafed.org, um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have uh, related to storytelling for advocacy specifically. So thank you for taking the time to watch our webinar today. We hope you have a great afternoon, and um, lo we look forward to seeing you at a storytelling presentation or watching you share your story, whether that be with a member of Congress or at your local local organization or um, just in a grocery at the grocery store with a friend uh, wherever you share your story as Dana said it's powerful it's important um, and it's really about telling your truth so thanks so much <laughs>